The topic of today's lecture is summarizing data and how to summarize data with R. First, we are going to look at measures of central tendency. We are going to talk about the mean. This could be the arithmetic mean or also the weighted mean and also median or mode. Then we are going to move on to measures of dispersion. Think about measures of dispersion as a measure to how far is the data spread around the mean. There we are going to look at range. We are going to look at the variance and the standard deviation. But we are also going to learn about the interquartile range or IQR as an abbreviation and the coefficient of variation. Now note that measures of central tendency and measures of dispersions are numerical summaries in the sense that they give you a number summarizing your data. Very often it is also important to look at graphical summaries. There we are going to look at histograms, we are going to look at what is called the empirical cumulative distribution function and we are going to look at box plots. The final topic of this lecture is covariance and the correlation coefficient. Now think about the arithmetic mean as simply a fancy word for average. So for example, if I had the class scores of the first homework or the final exam in a class and I wanted to calculate the average, what I would do is I would sum up all the values, all the scores and divide it by the number of students. This would give me the arithmetic mean. Note that we also have the weighted mean. Now think about the weighted mean as slightly different from the arithmetic mean. If you are taking college classes, then you have classes that give you three credit hours and you have classes that give you one or two credit hours. Now if you get a, an A in a class with three credit hours, this is going to impact your GPA or your cumulative GPA differently than getting an A in the one credit hour class in the sense that the A in the three credit hour class is going to be weighted more heavily than uh, the A in the one credit hour class. It is probably easiest to look at the concept of weighted mean with an example. Suppose that you're taking an O'Neill class and the professor bases the grades on homework, midterm exam, final exam, term paper, presentation of term paper and participation and assume that the homework is worth 10%, the midterm exam is worth 20%, the final exam is worth 30%, term paper is 25%, and the presentation and participation are 15%. Each item, meaning the homework, midterm exam, final exam, etc., is based on a 100-point scale, and your scores are 85 for the homework, 57 for the midterm exam, 78 for the final exam, 92, 95 and 10 points for the term paper, its presentation and participation respectively. Now you can calculate those, the, you can calculate the weighted mean by hand or you can simply use R for this. Let us do an example with regard to the mean and the weighted mean. Suppose that I have three scores from three students. Let's call those students one, two, and three. And their respective scores X are 75, 81, and 84. Then the arithmetic mean of those three scores would be 75 plus 81 plus 84. You sum them up and you divide by 3. And the result you would get is 240 divided by 3. So the average score is equal to 80. 
when you have the weighted mean, again, suppose that you are getting an A in a three credit class, and you are getting a B in a one credit class, so the A is associated four, the B is associated with three, then in this case the weighted mean would be four times three plus three times one divided by four. So in this case you would have 12 plus 3 is 15 divided by 4, which would give you a weighted mean of 3.75. Note that this is different than if you were to take the unweighted mean, which would be equal to 3.5. But this would not be correct since the B is associated with a one credit hour class and the a is associated with a three credit hour class. So given the O'Neill class and the professor who assigns different weights to the various components of the class, and if you want to calculate the weighted mean, then you could do this uh, very simply in uh, R. So let us just enter the data manually. So assume that you're going to enter the weights first. Now, we said that the weights for the homework, midterm exam, final exam, and so on, are uh, 10%, uh, 20%, 30, 25, 10, and 5. Okay, And that the scores for those exams that the student uh, for those uh, components are 85, 57, and so on. So you can calculate or you can enter them in R. And then to calculate the weighted mean, there's a function which is called well, weighted mean, where x is the values that you would like to uh, take the mean of, and w represents the weight. So in this case, we are going to enter scores and weights. You hit enter, and you can see that the weighted mean is 76.3. Now, the mean of the data is a very useful concept, but sometimes it can be misleading. Let me give you an example. In Switzerland, the average taxable income across the entire country is around $57,000. Now, there is a small town, and the taxable income of that town is at $670,000. Now, it turns out that in this town, you have a very wealthy person, and the town only has 178 inhabitants. What happens is that this one person, this one very large, this very high income person is influencing the mean to the point that you are getting this value of $670,000, meaning that 177 inhabitants actually are probably closer to the average value of the entire country and you only have this one person that is driving the value. To avoid this type of problem, there are two additional um, there are two additional measures of a central tendency. The one is the mode, and the second one is the median. The mode is simply the value of the observation that appears the most often. The median is the value that divides the data set into two equal parts. 50% of the observations are below the value and 50% of the observations are above that value. 
Now let us look at the concept of mean, mode and median using this example about three different states that each have 10 citizens. You see that in state one, everybody has the same income of 10. In state two, you have the person with the lowest income has an income of two, the highest has a, an income of 20. And in the last state, all the income or all the wealth is accumulated at the last person or with the last person or citizen number 10. Now, when you do the calculations, what you find is that the average income for each of the three states is identical in the sense that the average income is 10 for each of the three states. But as you can see, there is significant variation in the income distribution. Now, let us look at the mode. Remember, the mode is the value which appears the most often. So, in state number one, the mode is 10. In state number two, the mode is 10 again. But note now that in state number three, the mode, the value which appears the most often, is 2. With regard to the median, note that the values are already ordered in ascending order. Okay, so you have here you with the state number one, everybody earns 10. In state number two, it goes from the lowest to the highest. And the same is true for the third state. Now, the median is the value which divides the observations or your data set into two equal parts, where 50% of the observations are below the median and 50% of the observations are above the median. Since you have 10 citizens, You are interested in what is the value that divides the bottom five from the top five. So the median for state number one would be equal to 10. The median for state number two would be the average of nine and 10. So that would be 9.5. What this means is that 50% for state number two, 50% of observations are below 9.5 and 50% of observations are above 9.5. Now, when you do this for state number three, you see that the median for state number three is equal to two, meaning that 50% of the observations have an income of below two and 50% are above two. Note that now, the, especially the median, gives you a different image than simply looking at the mean. The median, in the case of state number three, is not influenced by the, out, by the very high value of 82. The range is simply the largest value minus the smallest value. So think again about the three scores of the three students which we had before. We had the score of 75, 81 and 84. So in this case the range would be the largest value, 84 minus the smallest value, 75. So the range in this case would be equal to 9. Now, a more useful measure of dispersion is the standard deviation and the variance. So we mentioned before that 
we have to distinguish between the population variance and the standard and the sample variance. Okay, so here, since assume that those three students are the entire class, then we are going to use the equation for the population variance. Remember that that equation is the sigma, the Greek letter sigma squared, equals to 1 over n. And then we are using the summation sign. where xi is the individual observation, mu is the, sam uh, is, the, is the population mean. So in the case of the three values, how you, we would calculate this? We said that the population mean is equal to, uh, is equal to 80. Okay, so what we would do, we have three observations, so we can write here one over three. And then we take each individual observation, 75, 81, 84, subtract the mean and square it. So in this case, we have 75 minus 80 squared plus 81 minus 80 squared plus 84 minus 80 squared which we can then calculate as follows, it's 1 over 3, then we have 75 minus 80 is negative 5, squared is 25, plus 81 minus 80 is equal to 1 squared, so 1 squared is simply 1, plus 84 minus 80 is 4, the squared is, is equal to 16. So we have one third times the sum of 25, 1, and 16, which is equal to 42. And hence the variance in this case is equal to uh, 14. Okay. Now the standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. So sigma without the squared is simply the square root of 14. And that is equal to 3.74. Now we mentioned before that if you have a sample Remember, a sample is a subset of the population and you want to estimate the variance of the population, then you have to use the formula for the sample variance and the sample standard deviation. So for the sample variance, the equation is s squared, so here we are not using the sigma squared, but we are using the s squared, and that is equal to 1 over n minus 1, and then we are summing up over all the observations, we take each observations, and we subtract the sample mean, and square it. So this here is now the sample mean. Now keep in mind that very much like the population variance and the population standard deviation, the sample standard deviation is simply the square root of the sample variance. Consider the following graph of why it is important to divide by n minus, minus 1 instead of dividing by n. Now, as I mentioned before, we know that the population variance or the population standard deviation 
is equal to 20. Okay. Now, what I do in this example, I am taking sample sizes from 2 all the way to 50. I'm taking a sample out of the population of, let's start with 2. And then I calculate, based on that sample, I'm calculating the variance. In one method, I am calculating the, or in one case, I am calculating the variance by dividing by n. And in the other case, I am dividing by n minus 1. And note that for each of the sample sizes from 2 to 50, I am actually drawing a thousand different samples and I'm calculating the average. So I'm taking a sample of 2, calculate the variance, then I take another sample of 2, calculating the variance, and so on. I do this a thousand times, and then I take the average of those samples. Now, what you see is that if you are dividing by n minus 1, you are much closer to the 20 than dividing by n. That is the reason why it is very important to differentiate between the sample variance or the sample standard deviation and the population variance or the population standard deviation. Now, the coefficient of variation standardizes the standard deviation by the mean. Because the magnitude of the standard deviation depends on the mean, and it is sometimes necessary to calculate the coefficient of variation to make two or more standard deviations comparable. For example, suppose that you are comparing the prices of residential homes in California and Indiana. You calculate the mean and the standard deviation for California as $2 million and $400,000 and the same values for Indiana are $125,000 and $50,000. Now, when you calculate the coefficient of variation, meaning you take, you calculate the standard deviation divided by the mean, you find that the coefficient of variation for California is 0.2, and the coefficient for, or coefficient of variation for Indiana is 0.4. What this means is that there is much more variation in the home values for Indiana than there is in California. Now, let us look at the empirical cumulative distribution function. Or let's abbreviate this with ECDF. Now, note that the concept regarding the ECDF that you are most likely familiar with is birth rate. So very often if you have a child then the doctor is going to tell you in what percentile your child is. So for example if your doctor says that weight wise your child is in the 80th percentile what this means is that 80% of the children in the same age bracket are lighter than your child and 20% of the children in the age bracket are heavier than your child. Okay, so let me do an example here. And suppose that the weight of the, child, of the baby is on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis ranges from 0 to 1. Now, further suppose that the weight of the baby, of all the babies, ranges from 4 pounds to 11 pounds. Okay? And now, remember that we have talked about the median before. And suppose that the median is, uh, say, 7 pounds. So what this means is that 50% of babies are below 7 pounds and 50% of babies are above 7 pounds. Now, if we were to represent this graphically, then we have the 7 pounds right here. And the 7 pounds is associated with the median of 50%, which we write here as 0.5. Okay, like this. And now note 
that since we said that the heaviest baby is 11 pounds, okay? so what this means is that at the value of 1, we have 11 pounds in the sense that 100% of babies are below 11 pounds. And also we assume that 100% of babies are above four pounds. So when you draw this, you would likely get a curve that looks like this. So this is an empirical cumulative distribution function. Now, how do you read this? Suppose that your doctor says that um, your baby is in the 75th percentile and suppose that your baby is 8 pounds. So what this means is that 75 of baby, 75 percent of babies are below eight pounds, and 25 percent of babies are above four pounds. So if you were to draw this in this graph here, you would have 0.75 here, and you would have the eight pounds right here. Okay. Now, suppose that you have a baby which is at, say, um, say 5.5 pounds. And suppose that your doctor tells you that this is in the 25th percentile. Then what this means is that you have the 0.25 here. And that you have the value of 5.5 pounds right here. Okay. And note, of course, since you know the entire function, you could even say if you have a, a, if you have a baby of, say, um, 6 pounds, then this function would help you to determine in which percentile this, uh, in the, which percentile your baby is. Now I did not pick 25 and 75 uh, randomly, but note that the 25 and the 75 uh, uh, quantile here are related to what is called the interquartile range. or IQR. Okay. Now, before we continue, let me explain the concept of quantiles. So quantiles are the value that, or values that divide the ordered observation into a set number of subsets, each containing the same percentage of observations. Okay, so we said before we have, for example, the median. So the median is the value, a single value, which divides the number of observations into two subsets. 50% are below that value and 50% are above the value. Now note that we can have so quantize is the overarching term. Then we have what is called, what are called quartiles. Now quartiles divide the sample such that we have four quartiles and uh, each contain 25% of the observations. So in the case with the birth rate of the babies, then we have the first quartile going from 4 to 
containing 25%. We have the second quartile going from 5.5 to 7 pounds, containing 25%. 7 to 8 containing 25%. And then the last quartile is from 8 to, 8 to 11 pounds, containing 25%. Note that you can also have quintiles. This separates the observations into five groups containing 20% each. And you also have percentiles containing the observations into 100 subsets containing 1% each. Note that you have the number of groups, let's call n being the number of groups, Of all subsets then you have n minus 1 uh, quantiles okay now in the case of the interquartile range we only look at the quartiles tiles now the interquartile range in this case goes from 5.5 to 8 pounds. So 5.5 to 8 pounds. What this interquartile range means is that 50% of your observations are between the 5.5 and 8 pounds. That is what the interquartile range is. The interquartile range is closely related to the concept of what is called a box and whisker plot. Now, above you see the homicide values in Norway. Note that the values are slightly different from what you have in the, uh, in the slides. Okay. Now, note that I have ordered those homicide values in ascending order, and we have a total of 11 values. Okay. So, or 11, in this case, uh, we have uh, 11 years. Now, let us first calculate the, the median and the first quartile and the third quartile. Note that the median represents the second quartile. Since we have 11 values, the median is represented by the sixth value. In this case, that would be the 29. So this would be uh, Q2 or would be the median. Okay. So the data set here is, uh, in this data set, the median is 29. Now, the first quartile is, which leaves 25% below and 75% of the observations above. So in this case, the first quartile is Q1, and which is equal to 27. Now note, when you do the calculations for the third quartile in R, the method used in R is slightly different than what I use here. But now let's keep it for this example, keep it simple. And let's just say that Q3 is equal to 34. Okay. Now what R does is R takes into account that the true median is slightly below this because you have this gap between 29 and 34. But note that this is right now uh, only a detail. In this case, we have the interquartile range going from 27 all the way to 34. So in this case, the IQR 
is equal to 34 minus 27 is equal to 7. Now, note that when you construct a box and whisker plot, that the box represents the interquartile range. So we have 27, we have 34, and usually you have a value or a bar here in the middle, and that represents the median value. Okay, so here we now have the box. Now, how do we construct the whisker? Now, to construct the whisker, the first thing we do is we take the IQR and multiply it by 1.5. In this case, 7 times 1.5 is equal to 10.5. Okay. Now, let me draw here temporary whiskers. Okay. And the length of those temporary whiskers is Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR or 34 plus 10.5. So you have this whisker, this temporary whisker going to uh, 44. Sorry, this one here is not 24, it's 27. Okay. And then you take the 27 minus the 10.5, which is equal to 16.5. Okay. And then what you do next, you look at whether at the lower end, whether your observations, whether there's any observations below 16.5. In our case, this is not the case. So what this means is that the whisker extends all the way to the lowest value, and that would be 24. Okay. In the upper case, note that we have the 44.5 and that we have two values which are above 44.5. What this means is that the whisker extends all the way to 44.5 and that we have two dots that represent 46 and that represent 111 and those two dots or those two observations are called outliers. Okay, so when you hear the term outlier in statistics, then this is how you determine which, va which values are outliers. Note also that some statistical value, some statistical software, so here I'm using an extending extending the whisker all the way to 44.5. Some statistical software packages, I think including R, is actually extending the whisker only to the value of uh, 34. Okay, But this does not change that you're going to have uh, two dots here that are representing the two outliers. In the data set, you also have the states, the states 1, 2, and 3, with their uh, 10 residents. Now, for any data set in R, if you want to summarize the data, you can use the function summary. In this case, we want to summarize the states, or the data set states. We hit enter, and now note that it gives you some simple summary statistics. It gives you the minimum value, it gives you the maximum value, it gives it calculates the mean. The note, as we said before, the mean is identical across the three states, but it also calculates you the median. Okay, 
And the median, of course, corresponds to the values that we have calculated, which are 10, 9.5, and 2. Note that later in the lecture, we are going to talk about quartiles, and it will become clear what the first quartile and the third quartile means in this particular case. Note that it is very simple to calculate the empirical cumulative distribution function in R. For this example, we are going to use the data which is contained in MH1, and MH1 represents the home values of 101 homes in the Meridian Hills neighborhood in Indianapolis. Okay. So let us first summarize the data. So we use the command summary, MH1, and then we use the dollar sign that we want to summarize price. And now note that the minimum home is valued at $84,900. The most expensive home is close to $1.5 million, and that the average is around $382,000. The median in this case is uh, 250000 or close to $250,000. Keep in mind that the median represents the second quartile. Okay? Now, if you want to calculate the interquartile range in this case, note that you have to take the third quartile minus the first quartile. So in this case, it would be 450000 minus the 179,998. So the interquartile range here is close to $270,000. Now, if you want to calculate this uh, box and whisker plot manually, note that you don't have, you never really have to calculate this manually because you have, um, you have a statistical software who can do that for you. But for the, uh, for the sake of explanation, I will still go uh, through the manual calculations for this example. Then you have the interquartile range of $270,000 and $2. So if you want to calculate the lower bound, you were to take the $179,998 minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. And so you will see that the lower value here would be negative $225,000. So what this means is that at the lower end, there is not going to be any outliers. So the whisker would, plot, would stop at $84,900. Now the question is, how is this going to look like if we are looking at the upper bound? Okay, so here the third quartile is $450,000. We replace this with a plus sign. And so note that now we have this upper limit here of $855,000. Now, when you look at the data, so every observation above $855,000 is going to be interpreted as an outlier. So when you look at the data, note that you can sort the data by ascending order then you see that you have this value of 849,900, which is still below the 855,000. But every other value in this data set here, above the $855,000, is considered to be an outlier. Now, if you were to plot this in R, what you would do is you would say box plot, and then you would say MH1, dollar sign, price. And now note that the box plot you are obtaining is limited here around $850,000, and everything else are outliers in this case. Now, if you want to translate the data into an empirical cumulative distribution plot, 
then you have to use the function ECDF. And you enter the data. If you simply use ECDF, then you're getting the individual values. But if you want to plot it, you have to use ECDF. And then now you are seeing here this empirical cumulative distribution function associated with the values of homes in the Meridian Hills neighborhood. So you can see, for example, that at the value of 500,000, that this is corresponds about to the 80th percentile, meaning that when I collected the data of those home values, that $500,000 was in the approximately 80th percentile, meaning that 80% of homes were less than $500,000 and 20% of homes were above $500,000. The last topic I would like to talk about is with regard to covariance and correlation. Now, the covariance and the correlation are measurements that well, measure the relationship between two variables. So far, we have just looked at one variable, for example, the price of homes in the Meridian Hills district or the number of homicides in uh, Norway. Now we are moving to looking at the relationship between two variables. Note that in, on this slide I have the equation for the covariance, but note that you actually never calculate the covariance by hand, but you are using uh, statistical software for this. Now, the covariance can be either positive, negative, or zero. If the covariance is positive, what this means is that if you have two variables, x and y, that they move in the same direction. So let us consider the example of homes. Then usually you would expect there to be a positive covariance between the square footage and the home value, meaning that the larger the home, the more expensive it is. Now, positive means that if the variable x goes up, then the variable y goes tends to go up as well. And if the variable x decreases, then y tends to decrease as well, in the sense that they move in the same direction. A negative covariance means that they move in the opposite direction. So if x increases, then y tends to decrease. Now, if two random variables are independent then the or uncorrelated, then the covariance between x and y would be equal to zero. In R, you can calculate the covariance by using the command cov, C-O-F, and you have to enter the first variable and you have to enter the second variable. Now, at this point, it is very important to realize that just because you have a covariance that is positive, meaning that they're moving in the same direction, or uh, if it's negative, they're moving in the opposite direction, does not tell you anything about the relationship between the variables in the sense of causation. Okay, And I will come back to this. This will be a topic that we are going to look at in the uh, section on regression analysis. Now, the issues or there are certain characteristics of the covariance in the sense that the covariance is very useful to determine the direction of change, but it's not very useful to determine the magnitude. Because, for example, in the above example, if you are transforming the square footage into square meters, that also changes the covariance. But the relationship between the variables hasn't really changed. In the sense that using different units changes the covariance, although nothing has changed in terms of the relationship. Now, there is the so-called correlation coefficient, which overcomes this issue. Now, the correlation coefficient, okay, is calculated by taking the covariance 
and dividing it by the square root of the variance of x times the variance of y. Note that the variance of x or any variance is always positive. So the denominator here is always a positive term. What this means is that the covariance or the sign of the correlation coefficient depends on the sign of the covariance. The properties of the correlation coefficient are that it varies between negative 1 and 1. Note that you never have a correlation coefficient which is above 1 or below negative 0.1 and that the sign provides the direction of the change and the value provides the magnitude of the change. And again, it is very important to realize that correlation coefficient, uh, that correlation does not mean causation, okay? Also note that the correlation coefficient has no dimensions. So let us illustrate this concept in R. For this example, we are going to use the dataset MH2, which contains 18 values of home values in the Meridian Hills district. We have price and we also have the square footage of the house. Now in the first step, let us calculate the covariance between the two measures of price and square footage. So we use the covariance, we say MH2 dollar sign price, comma, MH2, dollar sign square footage. And we find that the covariance is a very large number. Now, suppose that we are actually converting the square footage into square meters. So let's say MH2, dollar sign square meters. So we are simply creating a new column in the dataset MH2. And that new column is equal to the square footage. And we have to divide the square footage by 10.764 to get square meters. Now note that you have the square footage and you have the square meters. Now, if we are calculating the co covariance between the price and the area, but we are measuring the area in square meters, then you see that the covariance has changed, despite the fact that the relationship, meaning the relationship between price and the area, has not changed. Now, this is overcome by the correlation coefficient. So the correlation coefficient, to calculate the correlation coefficient in R, you are using COR. And you can say the MH2 price and then the square footage. And we see that the correlation coefficient is 0.89, meaning that if price tends to go up, or if price is high, square footage is high, or if price is low, the square footage tends to be low. Now, if instead we are measuring the correlation coefficient not using the square footage, but the square meters. What you see is that the correlation coefficient hasn't changed, and hence the correlation coefficient is a better indicator of direction and magnitude of the change than uh, of the relationship between the two variables than the covariance. Okay. Now, in this example, we are basically rescaling the area from square footage to square meters or vice versa. And uh, I would like to give you a little bit of an example that um, illustrates how important uh, scaling is, okay? Also in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, research. Now note that um, I'm by training, I'm an economist and um, Economists assume, in general, that people are making rational choices, okay? That presented all the information that they have uh, fixed preferences. Let me give you an example here of why that is not the case and how it relates to scaling. So, in this experiment, uh, researchers had a couple of respondents and they presented to those respondents um, two options for a cell phone plan. Under condition one, you have uh, dropped calls 
they have uh, two options. Uh, they have two cell phone plans, cell phone plan A and cell phone plan B. And the drop calls per 100 were 4.2 for plan A and 6.5 for plan B. And the cost per year was uh, $384 for A and $324 for B. Now, under this condition presented with this data, um, 35, 31% favored A and 35%, uh, 50, sorry, 53% favored B. Okay. Now, in a second experiment, they presented them with condition two, where they said the drop call is 42 per thousand for option A, 65 for option B and that the dollars per month is 32 versus $27. Now, under those conditions, or under condition two, 69% favored cell phone plan A, and 23% favored cell phone plan B. Meaning that under condition one, people preferred B, and under condition two, people preferred A. Now, the problem here is that both conditions are identical. The 4.2 per 100 are identical to 42 per 1,000. And if you multiply 32 times 12, then you're getting 384. And if you're multiplying 27 by 12, you're getting 324. What happens in this case is that people are drawn to the scaling. So in this case, people are drawing, drawn to the 324, which is cheaper than the 384. Okay, so hence they are preferring B. And in the case of condition two, they are drawn to 42 over 65, and they think that the difference of $5 is not that much. Well, this is $5 per month. Five times 12 is 60, which is exactly the difference that you find in con under condition A. So if you are listening, for example, to the radio and they say, they tell you, they offer you uh, something that, and they say it is only $2 per day, then uh, you never hear the sentence that it is, it is uh, $730 per year. Okay. So they are always trying to have the $2 per day. That doesn't sound, uh, it doesn't sound that much compared to the over $700 per year, what in reality it is. Okay. So just keep that in mind uh, for the remainder of this class.